BBOR Black Box Online Radio coming to you from West Virginia. Black Box Nerd 88 on Instagram for the bonus podcast. And just a quick reminder every Monday is Zodiac Mondays. Wednesday is an Ask Me Anything. That's an AMA, so please drop your questions below for things that you would like discussed here on the show. And Friday is an Anything Goes. Any subject is fair game, mostly talking about true crime, serial killers, the Zodiac Killer, but any subject is welcome. All right, so please share some ideas in the comment section about what you would like to hear about on this channel, and let's get started. Okay, hello everybody. Today is Monday, another Zodiac Monday. Welcome to the show, and just a couple of quick announcements before we begin. First, I would like to say a big thank you to everyone who listened to the Weekend AMA. On the weekends, I've been doing a debunking series where I've been talking about some Zodiac Killer suspects whom I think are absolutely not the Zodiac Killer. I call it the debunking series, but because I was unable to do an AMA last week, I decided to put one out on the weekend. That might happen from time to time, but I'm going to try and get one out Wednesday, according to plan. And the second announcement is, it appears there are still some technical difficulties going on with Launchpad 1, which is the podcast site that I use for Black Box Online Radio. So I'm going to try and get the episodes out there as soon as possible, but if you're listening to this as soon as it comes out, Maybe the um, audio version will not be available for quite some time. That's on them. As soon as it's up and running again, I will try and get all of the episodes over there so you can download Black Box Online Radio, take it on the go, anywhere and anyhow. Be one of the thousands of people who have downloaded this program for free using Launchpad 1. And another great way to support the show, in addition to just listening, is to go over to Amazon.com and look at the book Killer on a White Horse by me, Ned Dahan. It is a novel, murder mystery, inspired by the Zodiac-Manson connection, but totally fictional. And there is always the Teespring page. Have a look at some of the merchandise. And remember, being weird is not a crime. Today I'm going to be discussing the book America's Jack the Ripper, the definitive account of the Zodiac Killer. And I have to say that is a very big challenge to live up to, the definitive account of the Zodiac Killer. It is written by Soren Korsgaard, who has been researching the case for definitely some time. And one of the good things about this book is that it also has a lot of analysis on the unconfirmed Zodiac crimes. Some people believe the Zodiac Killer was operating as early as 1966. Some people believe that the Zodiac was operating as early as 1962. And some people, like David Gold, think the Zodiac Killer operated in 1946 and then onward. It really is un confirmed. In this book discussion, and I do have to emphasize this is not a traditional book review, this is talking about some ideas that are presented in the book America's Jack the Ripper and just a an ordinary discussion as opposed to criticizing every line the way that some people would do in a traditional book review. And I would like to begin though with the 1962 murder of Ray Davis because that is a Zodiac possible crime that I haven't talked about too frequently on the channel. And I would like to go to page 249 in America's Jack the Ripper by Soren Korsgaard. Raymond Davis, a 29-year-old cab driver, worked an evening shift from the Checker Cab Company. Ray, as his friends called him, was estranged from his wife, Marion. She lived with her two children from a previous marriage in Pomona, around 77 miles from Oceanside, while Ray and his brother Jack had moved to Oceanside in 1962. And in a different part of the book, Soren has said that Oceanside, California is 466 miles southeast of Presidio Heights, where Paul Stein was murdered. Ray and Jack had moved from Owasso, Michigan, a, a city even smaller than Oceanside. They had rented a house at 525 South Tremont Street. Ray had parked in the center of the Oceanside taxi stand at the intersection of Mission Avenue and Tremont Street, the best place to get a fare late at night. At 11.12 p.m., he briefly spoke to the dispatcher, Lowell Sykes, informing him that he was taking fare to Oceanside. Two hours and 35 minutes later, at 1.45 a.m., patrolman Terry L. Stevens 
discovered the body of Ray in the exclusive St. Mal residential district. Ray was lying in a pool of his own blood in the alley behind 1926 South Pacific Street, the home of Oceanside's former mayor, Joe McDonald. Right across the street was the home of Oceanside's current mayor, Erwin Sklar. While the murder of Ray Davis is an absolute tragedy and a big rest in peace to him, he was a taxi driver who was out driving late at night, and he was definitely blindsided by somebody. The reason that his case gets talked about in the 21st century is because there were a series of phone calls that came after the murder of Ray Davis in 1962, which some people think either mirrors the activities of the Zodiac Killer in the late 1960s, particularly in 1969, and they also note the similarities between this crime and the murder of Paul Stein on October 11th of 1969. I frequently put up a graphic on the channel that shows the circle with the Zodiac sign, and it's done in somewhat of an opposite way where there are two lines on one side and two lines on the other, but really, it should look more like coming full circle. Some people believe that there was a criminal masterpiece that was intended to have been committed by this person. And I do mean a criminal masterpiece, or as um, Ray Grant described it, a sinister form of conceptual art where the crimes could have a lot more significance than people actually believe. For example... Paul Stein was the final confirmed Zodiac killer victim, a taxi driver murdered in Presidio Heights. Ray Davis could have been the first victim. It's like starting the way that it ended, coming full circle, so to speak, and this is very relevant because of the Zodiac symbol. Then the second confirmed crime, or second to the last confirmed crime, would have been the Lake Berryessa stabbing, which occurred on September 27th of 1969. And then you have the Domingos Edwards murders in, on uh, June 4th of 1963, which are, again, very similar in the way that they've been created. It's almost like someone wanted to create a full circle set of murders. But is that actually what happened? I mean, I'm not 100% sure it's an unsolved case, and I'll save some of those commentary pieces for the end. But here on page 252, Soren Gorsgaard has the analysis of the Oceanside phone calls and the caller said, after the murder of Ray Davis, that is, I'm going to pull something in Oceanside, and you will never be able to figure it out. And then the next one, do you remember me calling you last week, telling you that I was going to pull a real baffling crime? I killed the cab driver, and I'm going to get me a bus driver next. And the third, tonight is the night I'm going to kill that bus driver. And what Sword and Korsgaard really does with this book is, he does linguistic analysis. He looks at the language of the perpetrators and tries to find out, are they the same person? And if we go a little bit farther ahead in the book, um, he has the Oceanside Slayer said, you'll never be able to figure it out. A quotation from the Zodiac Killer in November of 1970 is, I hope you have fun trying to figure out who I killed. The police shall never catch me because I have been too clever for them. The Ocean Slayer the Oceanside Slayer said, Do you remember me calling you last week, telling you that I was going to pull a real baffling crime? And the Zodiac said, I get awfully lonely when I am ignored. So lonely I could do my thing. I shall no longer announce to anyone when I commit my murders. Yes, I did make that call to you also. It was just a warning. But um, that was a comment. The last line came from 1966. And... There's some connections, and we'll talk about that later on. The Oceanside Slayer. I'm going to pull something here in Oceanside. The Zodiac said, Two cops pulled a goof about three minutes after I left the cab. I will do something nasty. No, um, about this goof line, some people think that that was intended to mean that they're talking about after the murder of Paul Stein on October 11th. Two cops pulled a goof about three minutes after I left the cab. Some people think that means the cops made a mistake. The other line could be that that goof is the Yiddish word for corpse and Paul Stein was Jewish. They pulled a Jewish man out of the cab 
but um, I don't want to talk about that too much now. The Oceanside Slayer said, I killed the cab driver. Zodiac, I'm the murderer of the taxi driver. I am the killer of the two teenagers. Oceanside Slayer, I'm going to get me a bus driver next. And the Zodiac said, School children make nice targets. I think I will wipe out a school bus some morning. So, um, I notice a particular difference with that there, and I'm sure you've caught on to that about I'm going to get me a bus driver next. The Zodiac talked about things like a bus bomb or to get the kitties as they come bouncing out. Well, that's talking more about the bus itself or about the children as opposed to specifically a bus driver. But as I was reading this, I just wanted to know more and more, okay, okay, but does Soren Korsgaard actually believe that these crimes are related? And I got my answer on page 258 when he says, it is clear from calculation that there is a great likelihood that the Zodiac killed Ray Davis. So there, there you have it, and he has uh, provided some things to me privately, which I'll share later on in the recording. I just haven't talked a lot about the murder of Ray Davis, and why not start from the beginning in 1962? Now, with a lot of these book discussions, I've been doing the things where I talk about the parts of the book that I like the most, and at other places I'll talk about the parts that I want to criticize. Hands down, the part of this book that I liked the absolute most was Soren Korsgaard's analysis of the Bates Confession Letter, the the, the confession that came after the Riverside murder in 1966. I do not believe that Sherry Jo Bates was a genuine Zodiac killer victim, but she is still someone who deserves to have justice and have her case solved. And also, we need to just get answers, I mean, to all of the questions. Sherry Jo Bates was murdered on October 30th of 1966, and her body was found on October 31st of 66 in an alleyway near the RCC library. There is there was a confession letter that was mailed after this to the Riverside Daily Enterprise. The envelope said Daily Enterprise, Riverside, California, attention crime. And it says the confession by blank. She was young and beautiful, but now she is battered and dead. She is not the first and she will not be the last. Soren made a very interesting observation when he described the author of the Riverside Confession Letter as being bipolar, and he doesn't mean that in the, um, like, clinical, psychological sense, if I understand him correctly. He just means that whoever wrote this one is using very polarizing adjectives, young and beautiful versus battered and dead, not the first but not the last, beautiful blonde, or maybe he'll go for the sharp-eyed, sharp blue-eyed brunette, actually it says shapely blue-eyed brunette, excuse me, not sick versus insane, the language is very polarizing. But Soren even points out that there are numerous differences between the the um, Riverside Confession letter and the Zodiac Killer letter, which would come in 1969. The first confirmed Zodiac crime was in 1968, the Lake Herman Road murders, which occurred on December 20th of that year. But the letters did not come until the summer of 1969. And on page 212 here in the book, Soren identifies a very particular sentence. If you followed the Zodiac case, I'm sure you'll be familiar with this. When he points to a line from the Riverside Confession that was typed, the Zodiac letters were handwritten, but this is a typed confession. She squirmed and shook as I choked her, and her lips twitched. She let out a scream. The word twist is spelled T-W-I-C-H-E-D, and she let out a scream. Then the Zodiac would write the famous saying about the twitch and squirm, quote, Some I shall tie over antils and watch them scream and twitch and squirm. Twitch is also misspelled in the Zodiac, some writing T-W-I-C-H. So, in the past... I said that the biggest thorn in my side about Sherry Jo Bates and her connection to the Zodiac Killer mystery was the Bates had to die letters. There were three letters that were mailed that said Bates had to die, there will be more, signed with a Z. One of them actually says she had to die, there will be more, but signed with that Z that has a little squiggle on it. 
In 2021, it was revealed that those were a hoax, a prankster, a teenager who was troubled, and he confessed to this in 2016. The authorities have investigated it, and a press release was issued this year saying that they confirmed that this teenager in 1966 fabricated the Bates Had to Die letters. And that was always the biggest thorn in my side about my standpoint that Sherry Jo Bates was not a genuine Zodiac victim. Someone was just messing around. Now that that one is out of the question, this is the biggest thorn in my side, this twitch and squirm letter, because even somebody like me, who has really tried to downplay the significance of the unconfirmed crimes, she squirmed and shook as I choked her, and, and her lips twitched. She let out a scream. Some I shall tie over antils and watch them scream and twitch and squirm. I mean, that is very, very similar, especially the fact that the word twitched is spelled in that particular way. And on this particular note, I've talked about two Zodiac unconfirmed cases, as really three with a briefly mentioning the Domingo Edwards murders. These are all unconfirmed crimes. The Zodiac um, was operating in 68 and 69 in what is known as the canonical crimes. And at this point, if I could add my own personal take on the subject, as of now, I do not believe that any of the unconfirmed crimes are actually committed by the Zodiac Killer. Instead, I think that that's more about people making connections that aren't necessarily there. And based on all of these similarities, I was really expecting that Soren Korsgaard was going to say that he thought the Zodiac Killer killed Sherry Jo Bates, and I also was expecting that this book here, America's Jack the Ripper, was going to be somewhat of a super conspiracy book, and I know I'm misusing that term, but one that just links together all of the Zodiac crimes, but that is not the case. If we go on to his conclusion, he pretty much says very clearly that the description of killing Sherry Jo Bates is in some respects consistent with the facts, whereas in other places it is not. So the person who wrote that confession letter, and Soren goes line by line in this, talking about the details of how they could have done that. Sometimes it's consistent, sometimes it is not. It, particularly this line, as I said, this is the best part of the book. I first pulled the middle wire from the distributor. A detective from the Riverside Police Department is paraphrased in an FBI report affirming that the manner in which her vehicle was disabled was known only to the subject and who murdered her. Specifically, the killer had pulled the coil wire of the distributor socket. However, this fact had already been published in numerous papers, for example, the Enterprise. So, someone could have learned about that from the papers. And Soren is, is exploring a theory which many of you guys have encouraged me to look at over the last year, and that is that, okay, the Zodiac Killer did not murder Sherry Jo Bates, but the Zodiac wrote that Riverside Confession. Some people insisted the Bates had to die letters, but they were like, the Zodiac wrote that confession letter on the typed uh, piece of paper. And on page 219, the, um, the sentence is just very clear. The facts strongly indicate that the Zodiac did not kill Sherry Jo Bates. And I always have some appreciation for people who aren't just attaching their theory or their suspect or their person of interest or their idea to the entire mystery, like it's saying that everybody from maybe as early as 1946 up until 1987 was murdered by the Zodiac Killer. Because it really shows that there is a metric that they are using and Soren is quite clear about that. In a previous communication, I had asked him to respond to some of these things because, okay, he seems to have taken a very strong stance on the Bates murder, but I contacted Soren Korsgaard privately, and I wanted to ask flat out, all right, you use some terms like there's a likely chance that the Zodiac murdered Ray Davis, and you have stated this, that the Zodiac killer did not murder Sherry Joe Bates, but you do notice that there are certain um, aspects of the confession that are quite similar with the Zodiac's language. Can I just get some definitive answers? Can you put a number on this on my channel here, Black Box Online Radio, which I always invite you guys to like and subscribe to? I do those suspect ratings, or the unconfirmed incident ratings. You put it on a scale of 1 to 10. 
one being the lowest and ten being the highest, what is the likelihood that the Zodiac Killer was involved with these crimes? And this is important because it would show us that there is a type of super criminal going on operating from 1962, a serial killer who flew under the radar that nobody was able to catch on to. And there were people who were suspicious about this, and I'm hoping to talk more to Michael Cole, author of the Zodiac Revisited trilogy, who has a lot to say about how people were very suspicious of links between the um, murders of the Swindles in 64 and the Domingos Edwards murders in 63. Soren's numbers for this. What is the likelihood that the Zodiac Killer committed the murder of Ray Davis in 1962? He says 9 out of 10. It's a 90% chance that that was the same person who committed the canonical crimes. And I'm like, well, what about the Domingos Edwards murders in 63, where Robert Domingos and Linda Edwards were gunned down on Gaviota Beach, or a beach near Gaviota State Park? It's outside of Gaviota State Park, outside of uh, Santa Barbara, California, he says 80 or 90 percent, 8 out of 10 or 9 out of 10. Now, you've taken a very strong stance on the letter. Well, like, what is the probability that the Zodiac Killer wrote the Bates Confession letter? She was young and beautiful now that she is battered and dead. And Sword says 10 out of 10, 100 percent. What's the probability that the Zodiac actually committed that murder? 1 out of 10 or 2 out of 10, 10% or 20%. And um, 80 or 90% for the Swindle murders, which I hope to do a full episode on in the near future. Okay, so much appreciated to Soren Korsgaard for discussing that with me right there. Also on page 222, Soren talks about how the person who mailed in these letters did this in 1967. There are those three letters that were mailed in that say, Bates had to die, there will be more, and they're assigned with what appears to be a Z. The signature at the bottom appears to be a Z. I love how that's phrased because it looks like a Z, but it seems like somewhat of a squiggle. Some people thought that it was the number 32. Some people thought that it was a Theban L. And Soren made a very interesting note that those letters were written on loose-leaf binder paper. And recently, on the Zodiac Killer channel, I interviewed Mike Rodelli, who is the author of In the Shadow of Mount Diablo and the Hunt for Zodiac. He talks about his suspect, Shel Cavale, a lot in that interview. I'm also the host of the Zodiac Killer channel's interviews with the expert series. I invite you to like and subscribe to that channel as well. But Mike Rodelli pointed out that the Zodiac used something called monarch-sized paper, also referred to as monarch-cut paper, which is 7.25 by 10.5 inches. The paper was not white, but a light parchment color, and I cite the Quester files for that uh, description right there. But what Mike Rodelli wanted to convey was monarch-sized paper is usually from formal stationary sets, that would be obtained by people in affluent social groups, high society, for lack of a better term. I don't want to mess around with the terms too much because I might say something I'll regret. But it's not loose-leaf binder paper. Now, who would do something like that? Well, a teenager who's making a prank or a sick joke. And since the publication of this book, I think that um, many people have accepted those findings that were put out, and um, that was a press release that was issued earlier this year in 2021 that though the Bates had to die letters that were signed with a Z were determined to have been a hoax. Now on a different type of commentary note, I would recommend this book, America's Jack the Ripper, to someone who is very new to the case because what a lot of people would want to do is they would watch the Fincher film from 2007 or maybe they were like me and started reading about the suspects online on websites like ZodiacKiller.com, and they were curious and they wanted to know more. So then what do they do? Like, what would be a good book to start? Absolutely this one, America's Jack the Ripper, because it is so analytical. It would be purely impractical to read anything from Robert Graysmith, even though he brought a lot of attention on the case. He ignited a lot of the general public's fascination with the Zodiac Killer mystery, However, Graysmith was caught lying numerous times or publishing uh, what is now determined to be graysmithing. I have to quote Drew Beeson for creating that word. 
graysmithing meaning splicing together two ideas that do not belong, and there could be numerous reasons why Graysmith did that, which I won't get into in this episode. But this one, um, America's Jack the Ripper, provides a lot of uh, commentary, as well as um, discussing the, um, as I said, linguistic analysis. But if we're going to talk about the letters, the appendices in this book really provide a lot of the um, photocopies of all the different letters. And to finish the thought before I go on to the next one, I found that um, a, lo a lot of the info was very basic to someone who has been spending some time with this material, like Lake Herman Road, Blue Rock Springs, Lake Berryessa, and the Stein murder. But of course, if someone were very new to those um, cases and they wanted to read up on them, I would definitely recommend this book. But I found that the parts that I truly wanted to explore more were as these things about the the linguistic analysis of the letters, talking about the unconfirmed crimes, and with some of the confirmed Zodiac letters, I'm going to admit that I was wrong about something, and that Soren Korsgaard's book allowed me to understand that. Recently on the channel, I did um, an episode called Ten Myths About the Zodiac Killer, which the title came from an article that had been written by Michael Butterfield, and... I was just responding to his article, Ten Myths About the Zodiac Killer, and then I thought, okay, he wrote that, not me. Why don't I make something about my own observations about the Zodiac Killer? You know, ten bold and um, unaccepted claims about the Zodiac, or the ten overlooked observations of the Zodiac Killer mystery, but with a better title, of course. And one of them that I was going to include was that the Melvin Belli letter was not authentic. And somebody wrote into the comment section, I think it was NPC Porky, but I'm not 100% sure it's been months ago. And they were like, Nid, there's no possible way that the Melvin Belli letter was not authentic. It contained a piece of Paul Stein's bloody shirt, the taxi driver who had been murdered that I was just talking about. Well, I insisted some way, somehow. I was like, I don't care. The Melvin Belli letter is not authentic because if you just look at the handwriting, I mean, look at it. The Zodiac letters are sloppy and disorganized. They tilt to one side. They are not in line. And the Melvin Belli letter is everything to the contrary. In the book, The Myth of the Zodiac Killer by Thomas Henry Horne even lays out a case about how a particular active participant named Robert Smith could have been the suspect for writing the Melvin Belli letter, and then going on to write some other unconfirmed Zodiac communications, particularly the 1978 letter. But I was wrong. I was wrong. Um, yes, the handwriting is different. Yes, the handwriting is very neat, and the Zodiac's other letters are very sloppy. But when I looked through the appendix, the appendix and just could see all the letters, and not only the letters, but the envelopes that Soren Korsgaard had posted here, it seems very clearly that, yes, indeed, it is the same handwriting. It really was looking at those envelopes, because that showed me that this person is either intentionally distorting their handwriting, or they are trying to make... Um, the Melvin Belli letter neater, like they're on their best behavior with the Melvin Belli letter. I don't know exactly why that is, but if you look at the if you look at the envelopes and the things that say editor San Francisco Chronicle, you can see that there are some major hallmarks of the Zodiac's handwriting, plus some major hallmarks of the person who wrote the Melvin Belli letter. It seems somewhat in between. Okay, yes, it came from the same person. I was wrong, and I'm so glad I didn't make that video. Ten overlooked observations about the Zodiac Killer mystery by Ned from Black Box Online Radio. Okay, well, thanks, Soren. You saved me some public embarrassment. No, I wouldn't be embarrassed by that if it was something that I genuinely believed at the time, but enough about me. Let's get back to his book. To move on to the canonical crimes, I would like to look at a particular observation and theory that Soren has mentioned about the Lake Berryessa stabbing that occurred on September 27th of 1969. The Lake Berryessa stabbing is a crime that is quite different than the other Zodiac canonical crimes. It's the only crime that occurred during the daytime. It's the only time the Zodiac killer wore that 
executioner style hood, or I should say the shopping bag style hood. But there are two other people who are involved with the Lake Berryessa stabbing, whom I haven't talked about a lot in my previous episodes. Maybe you've seen that one composite sketch that was done of a guy who had very dark hair, and um, he has somewhat of a rectangular face with a pointed chin, who was witnessed by three girls. He is known as the Voyeur, and there's another person that Soren calls the Mysterious Man. And I would just like to go to one of the earlier sections in his book, page 71, when he talks about these two people. On September 28th, Narlo and Lonergan interviewed Dr. Clifton Rayfield and his son David. At around 6.30 p.m. the previous evening, just less than a mile from Bryant's Carmen Gia, the father and son spotted a Caucasian male. He was about 5 feet 10 inches tall, heavily built. He was dressed in a long-sleeved, dark shirt with some red features. His pants were dark. As soon as he noticed David, he departed by changing direction. The two investigators opined that it was unlikely that this man was the Zodiac due to the timing and geography of the area, and yes, the Zodiac Killer, or someone, did write 6.30 p.m. on the card, or he wrote 6.30 after writing September 27th, 1969. That is also an interesting feature of the um, card or at Lake Berryessa. There's the Zodiac symbol, the word Vallejo. It says 12-20-68-7-4-69, sept-27. 1969, like um, the word se- se- the words, uh, September is spelled out S-E-P-T. Someone once uh, proposed something to me that it's a numerical clue because set is the um, French number 4, 7, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 is the um, French number 7. So it's meant to um, not be 927, but 727. I don't know if there's anything there. I just, I appreciate the observation. I like the kind of outside-the-box thinking. But yeah, 6.30 was also written on the car door, the only one that included the time of the murder. And then it says, by knife. And it is interesting that the man did not report his presence to the Napa Sheriff's Department since he had been near a murder scene just at the right time. Considering the direction of the Zodiac shoe prints, in the 15 minutes that he spent with Brian and Cecilia, the killer could not have approached Clifton and David before the stabbing, only after it. And from reading on this in the past, I believe the 6.30 p.m. was meant to be the end of the stabbing, not the beginning. Like the person who wrote that message was not referring to... um, the time when things would have started by the time that things would have ended. Although the individual was heavy and wore dark clothes, like the Zodiac, it is unlikely to have been him. A few hours prior to the crime, the erratic behavior of a man agitated three girls, Joanne, Linda, and Linda Lee. They told their story to Lonergan, Snook, and Townsend on September 28th. They believe their experience could be related to the stabbing of Brian and Cecilia, Two days later, a sketch was made available in the Napa Register. That was the one that I was just talking about that has the um, dark um, brown hair as well as the um, rectangular face with the pointed chin. But what I thought was much more um, interesting about this one is that Soren seems to have almost completely ruled out that that man who was seen by Clifton and David, the mysterious man, was the killer. It seems like that guy was not. He's probably just some guy who's walking in a public park. But let's hear more about the voyeur from Lake Berryessa. The investigators took notes while interviewing the girls. When we compare the notes, there is a variation expected. However, take it as a whole. The notes suggest between 2.55 p.m. and 3.30 p.m., the girls at Lake Berryessa on Knoxville Road, approximately two miles north of the A&W root beer stand, They noticed a 1966 or 1967 sky blue or silver blue two-door Chevrolet sedan with a rather long and round taillight set. The driver was a white male, noticeably parked close to their car near the rear bumper. The driver of the car reappeared while the girls were sunbathing in their bikinis. He stared at them from the edge of some trees. He would look away when they looked back at him. 
He stayed close to the girls for about 30 to 45 minutes. See, um, I've um, read some things about the Lake Boreas of Voyeur before, but I didn't realize that he was watching them for that long, as much as 45 minutes, and talk about creepy. His car was gone when they departed at 4.30 p.m. Is the Voyeur the Zodiac? The first step in examining that question is to compare the physical characteristics of the two and then determine if the specific type of car they observed has a track width of about 57.5 inches. And, um, well, sorry, we'll go into some analysis on that. To save you guys some time, I will jump ahead to the conclusion it is very likely that the voyeur was the Zodiac scouting the area for potential victims. And at this time, I would just like to ask you guys some challenge questions. And if you've listened this far in, I'm sure that you'll have a lot to say about the bold claims made by Soren Korsgaard in this book, America's Jack the Ripper. Why don't we start from that info just laid out at Lake Berryessa. Number one, do you believe the mystery man seen by the doctor and his son walking in the vicinity of the crime scene around 6.30 p.m. was the Zodiac Killer? You heard Soren very clearly say no. Do you believe the voyeur who was watching the three girls at Lake Berryessa was the Zodiac? And Soren has some reasons about like analyzing the um, width of the tires and so on. This book is very analytical, but I wanted to get right to the point. He believes that that was the Zodiac. Do you think that was the Zodiac killer, the voyeur who was watching the three girls? Next question would be, do you believe the Zodiac killer murdered Ray Davis in 1962? Do you believe the Zodiac murdered Robert Domingos and Linda Edwards in 1963? Do you believe the Zodiac murdered Sherry Joe Bates in 1966? And that is a two-part question, because, as I said, many of you guys have brought this to my attention just writing in the comments section on Black Box Online Radio saying, I don't think the Zodiac killed Sherry Joe Bates. I think the Zodiac, however, did indeed write that typed confession. So that's the next part. Do you think the Zodiac authored the typed confession letter. She was young and beautiful, now she is battered and dead. Miss Bates went to the slaughter like a lamb. That one. But I would like to um, also look at some notes that were made about Soren Korsgaard's uh, book, in Soren Korsgaard's book, actually. This is on page 247. And it's going back to the events of Wednesday, April 7th, 1971. Firstly, do you guys uh, know what that is? Wednesday, April 7th? 1971. What happened? Well, the Zodiac Killer premiered in cinemas in California, and if you would like to watch that movie, it is available on YouTube for free. I watched it back in, I think it must have been 2019, I think it was, but um, yes, it's available online for free. There are numerous Zodiac Killer movies, actually, as we'll see. Tom Hansen directed the one hour and 27 minute long film. The manuscript had been loosely based on the actual killings, despite it being a very obvious low-budget film, we would expect the Zodiac to send an explicit review due to his inability to stop writing about himself and his obsession with movies. He never did, not even a veiled reference. Again, we see a manifestation of his unpredictable character. If we're going to look at Wednesday, April 7th, 1971, this is approaching the two-year halt in Zodiac activity. Some people believe that all of the... um communications after November 9th of 1969, or I'll give some leeway November 20th and December 20th, excuse me, December 20th of 1969, the Melvin Belli letter and so on. All right, I now think it's authentic. I was wrong. But the um, they believe that this is approaching the Holton Zodiac activity. He could have been incarcerated for two years, going to a mental institution for two years, being deployed in the military out of the country. There could be reasons why someone would either stop writing the letters or be on the verge of a major life-changing decision. And even in Mike Morford's theory about his suspect Macduff, he proposed that he was starting a new job with the state of California and that he was experiencing some major life-changing events. Somebody asked me the question, was he the only person who got a job in 1971? And I know you're all probably poking fun at me for saying something similar about Richard Gajkowski um, in 1974, but I um, no, Macduff was not the only person who got a job in 1971, but as more laid out in our Interview with the Experts series, which you can hear on the Zodiac Killer channel, that 
After looking into the Golden State Killer mystery, he learned that there are certain stressors in a person's life, like once they're having a major career change, as Macduff did, or getting married, which um, Macduff got married in 1974, and that also coincides with the Exorcist letter and so on, that these can alter a serial killer's behavior. The birth of a child would be another one. And no, I don't endorse any suspects on this channel. I was just giving some examples about Macduff, to be clear. But why didn't the Zodiac respond to the 1971 film? Why not? I mean, and the 1971 film actually mirrors a lot of what um, actually happened in the crime scenes. Somebody even responded here on Black Box Online Radio saying, I watched the 1971 film after your recommendation, and they were just surprised that they actually got so many of the canonical uh, crimes accurate, like the Lake Berryessa stabbing. But also, there was a particular note about the Lake Herman Road murders that I made. If you do watch the 1971 film, I was like, they had the Zodiac Killer walking up and committing the Lake Herman Road murders, wearing blue jeans and a bright red or orange jacket, and wearing brown shoes, and then I was like, why not? Why not? I mean, of course, when I always visualize the Zodiac, I would think about him wearing all black or maybe something like the um, Lake Berryessa costume, but why not? There are no witnesses who saw the killer. He could have been wearing an orange jumpsuit, as one of you guys said in the comments section. So uh, that, was, that was just, I thought, a very, very interesting detail. And, I mean, if you do watch that movie, the 1971 film, you'll also see about how they put forward this theory that the Zodiac actually believed that he could uh, commit murders and those who he had killed would be his slaves in paradise, and he's doing meditative rituals to try and connect with his slaves in paradise. That stuff I didn't care too much for, but the uh, way that they showed the canonical crimes... But I still haven't answered the question, why did the Zodiac Killer write a letter about the 1971 film when he was so full of himself? Uh, one person put it forward their theory that they thought the movie production company was behind this, and I don't endorse that theory, but they, put, they, th they said the movie production company was behind this. They set the whole thing up to draw attention for their movie, that that's why there's this um, hooded costume at Lake Berryessa. It was made by a costume department, and that they wanted to create a series of murders and then make a serial killer movie. I would need a lot more than just, um, just a surmise before I endorse that theory. But again, that's outside the box thinking. Or it could be that the person was dealing with issues in his real life, and he, um, chose to stay silent because he had other things on his mind than the Zodiac film, or the hoax theory. That's always a possibility that it just wasn't relevant to the communications. But um, there's another part here in Soren's book on page 247 that says, in December of 1971, December 23rd, 1971, the first of five Dirty Harry movies made its way into the cinema. It was immediately well received by the critics and it became a commercial success. Unlike The Zodiac Killer, which premiered a few months earlier, the producers had a $4 million budget to work with. The manuscript is inspired by the Zodiac's work. The man yeah, the manuscript is inspired by the Zodiac's work, but with unique twists and turns. A maniac who calls himself Scorpio terrorizes San Francisco by killing people and sending taunting letters. Inspector Harry Callahan, known as Dirty Harry, is assigned to stop him. A cat and mouse game ensues. Mysteriously, the Zodiac had nothing to say about Dirty Harry. But the Zodiac did respond to um, other movies, particularly The Exorcist, saying I saw and think The Exorcist was the best satirical comedy ever. Now... This is going to be a little bit weird, but giving a shout out to YouTube user Jamie Hendrickson, who um, shared a couple comments here on Black Box Online Radio about this subject, saying that he thought the Zodiac passed away very early on, perhaps in the 1970s, because if the Fincher film had been put out in 2007, the one with Jake Gyllenhaal and uh, Robert Downey Jr. and Mark Ruffalo, if that one had been put out in 2007 and the Zodiac were still alive, he couldn't resist to write about it. 
many people have suspects who passed away in 2009, 2010. We were just talking about Gary Post uh, the other day. He passed away in 2018. Why wouldn't someone respond and write a letter about the Fincher film if they were still alive and able to do so? They're at the end of their life. Even if they get caught, they're only going to go to jail for like five months or something. I mean, maybe. Who who really knows? Who knows? But why didn't why did the killer stay silent if he were still alive? And I would propose that uh, question to anyone who has a suspect out there who is still alive. I mean, a lot of people have. I just mentioned a few of them. So... One reason could be that the Zodiac simply didn't care about how he was depicted on film. 1971, Dirty Harry and the other Zodiac film, the Zodiac didn't respond to that stuff. There could also be, um, maybe the Zodiac actually secretly really enjoyed being portrayed on film and thought if he responded in a letter saying, yes, that jerk who played me on screen is a total little whiny sack of shit, people would be like, oh, well... I mean, it would discourage other people from making content. The Zodiac might just be sitting back eating his popcorn and being like, I'm better than that guy, and just didn't want to say anything that would dissuade anybody from from perceiving the uh, Zodiac films in their own entertaining light. I don't really know. I'm just uh, kind of guessing that point, because that is one that I simply do not have an answer for. However, to give... A final response to the book America's Jack the Ripper, the definitive account of the Zodiac Killer. Soren Korsgaard seems to believe that there are other crimes that have a very high likelihood of being connected to the Zodiac Killer mystery. I do not believe that any of the unconfirmed crimes have that high of a likelihood. In the past, I said Sherry Jo Bates, mostly because of those Bates had to die letters, but I'm just not convinced. And I think a lot of people really want to push their narrative and find out that there is this serial killer who is just brilliant and flying under the radar, but I'm not convinced at all. The more I learn about the Zodiac case, the more I think that this person just, um, or maybe it's a group, maybe it's a hoax, it's an unconfirmed case. I don't endorse any suspects on this channel unless I'm, a, I'm like 100% certain that it's, it's the person. But I think that that is too much of an overreach to say that the um, it's likely that the murder of Free Davis was committed by the Zodiac killer. And of course, uh, Soren, you know, gave his numbers. He didn't say 100% on all of them. He said 10 for 10, 100% on the Zodiac writing the base confession letter. I would have to disagree with that. I'm not 100% convinced. It's the biggest thorn in my side, the twitch and squirm line, but... I think that I think maybe within several years we might learn that that was also a prank. So, what do you think about any of that? And you know, there's nothing wrong with disagreeing. I mean, a lot of people are going to disagree with many of the comments that I say. A lot of people look at some of the um, psychological observations that I make about true crime cases. Somebody even called me out on some of the stuff I said about the Long Island serial killer, which I will happily dispute on the Wednesday AMA shows, and uh, sometimes those will be moved over to the weekend programs. But I would recommend this book to you, America's Jack the Ripper, the definitive account of the Zodiac Killer. But I do have to emphasize that the definitive account of the Zodiac is a very hard uh, title to live up to. Overall, as I said, it's it would be something that I would think you should give to someone who is brand new to the case. Like, they watch the Fincher film, maybe they watch the 1971 Zodiac movie, and they're curious and they want to learn more. I think it would be better than Robert Graysmith's book. And also, there is uh, so much analysis in this. There are so many observations of how the letters were written and all the appendices, whereas a lot of people blend in all of their things together, and then you can get, you can get Tom Voigt's Zodiac, Just the Facts, but... I think that you would want to read something like this one first, America's Jack the Ripper, before you just read the police reports in chronological order. If anybody would like to, uh, to respond to any of the comments that I've made in the comments section down below, I would love to read your comments. Maybe they'll be featured on an AMA one of these days and ask me anything or one of the many Q&A sessions here on this channel. Thank you so much to Sword and Korsgaard who provided me with a copy of his book, as well as Rescued and Restored by Raul Cortez from his publishing company, Korsgaard Publishing. And anybody can write the show at blackboxonlineradio at aol.com, and you can get in touch with me there. 
So, America's Jack the Ripper, the definitive account of the Zodiac Killer by Soren Korsgaard. You can get it anywhere books are sold. That's all for me now. See you on Instagram for the bonus podcast. Until next time.